welcome once again everyone to this Interact online lesson and in this one we will talk a bit about soil and what we researchers uh, do with soil why we are interested in it and also what in the end what you can do actually to help soil health and the title suggests really that it's a bit of an unknown microcosmos that we have actually not a lot of knowledge about and you will see why and what we are trying to improve there my name is cornelia klutsch before we really start i thought i'll just talk a tiny bit more about myself i'm a biologist and i work as a researcher on a biological station called nebius swanov so here at the left hand side there's also a picture from the summer uh, of the station uh, with a little pond in front right now it's quite dark uh, because we are 400 kilometers north of the arctic circle and right now the sun does not come over the horizon so it's sort of the dark time in the winter for six to eight weeks the station is located basically at the most northeastern uh, tip of norway very close to the russian and finnish borders in this little wedge here um, and it's actually very very close to the russian border so the station is here and you can basically walk sort of probably 15 minutes to a river called the Pacific river uh, which i talk about quite a bit in other uh, presentations for interact and the middle of the river is basically the border to Russia. So it's a shared border between Norway and Russia and our Russian uh, friends are over here. Um, and uh, we have quite a number of Russian colleagues we are working together with. And because we are situated so far in the north, uh, a lot of research we are doing deals with uh, changes like climate change um, but also pollution and quite a bit of ecological research going on a lot of research however is also connected to genetic methods and we have a genetic lab up here in the past we mainly studied large mammal species like brown bear and polar bear but over the last sort of five six years we extended our research focus and study now of, uh, fish species, for example, in the Pacific River, but also uh, other organisms like insects. And it's connected to this presentation. We have recently started looking more into soil organisms. And I will explain why in a minute. But before I do, I just thought I'd give you a short overview um, what we will cover today. And the first question is actually to give you a bit of introduction and a few explanations and definitions and a bit of uh, background why we actually study soil. What is known, what is not known currently, what will we do in the future? And then we will have a sort of sneak peek into one of the projects we currently have at Nebius Swanhoft and a bit uh, on what methods we use. And I specifically put a focus on here uh, which methods can actually be used, for example, in classrooms as a class project as well. Then we have ecological functions. So I will introduce you to a few soil groups. There are many and I won't have time to cover them all, but a few key groups uh, that we are studying and why and what their tasks are actually in soil, why they are important. And I will close this talk uh, basically with um, a bit on what every one of us as citizens can do to uh, improve soil health and why this is uh, important and how this is connected to climate change actually. And finally, I said, if there's time, there will be a Kahoot. It depends also a bit on how many people we are. Uh, so we'll see uh, yeah, if there are enough people to do this. So, first of all, it's very important to realize that soil biota, so all the, the, the species that we have in soil, um, are equal to 25% of global biodiversity. So all the species we have, all the biodiversity that's around us, 25% is found in soil. That's quite a striking number because I think a lot of people are not aware that a quarter of all the biodiversity is found in soil. Because we probably 
humans are probably more drawn to species uh, that they can see uh, and that are not in soil but above ground, like trees, bears, and uh, other species. So we, if we can't see it, we tend to forget about it. But particularly in soil, it's very important that we take care of the soil biodiversity. I will talk a bit more about this later. So we know actually not a lot about soil species, the biodiversity and the ecological functions they have. So there's a real research need to do more studies uh, on soil and what lives in soil and how this all works. Uh, and this is particularly important because we know quite a bit about above uh, above ground diversity, as I mentioned, we know a bit about quite a bit about the plants that we see. But in soil and the soil organisms are very much important and connected to, for example, plants, because a lot of soil organisms live between the roots of uh, plants and uh, have important functions for plant growth, for example. And from a research side, this goes back to a lack of coordination. It seems that they are just sort of isolated studies. And we as a research community have to become better, to be more strategic how we summarize uh, all the knowledge that's there and identify also more strategically which studies needs to be, which studies need to be done. And just to drive this point home in another way, how important and how much is in soil to be found. If you have just one hand of soil, as shown here, you have an incredible biodiversity. So you have something like 50 kilometers of mycelium. This is basically fungi that build a network. So that's quite a distance, 50 kilometers. 10,000 nematodes is one of the species groups we'll talk about a bit more today. If you think about bacteria, you have probably something like more than 100 million bacteria just in a handful of soil. Uh, probably up to 5,000 insects, spiders, uh, little snails and worms. Even algae you have uh, hundreds of species. And then you have in the hundred thousands of uh, protozoan cells, for example, amoebae and other species and quite large biodiversity there as well. So if in a handful of soil, there's about 0 0.5 grams of living matter of these uh, species, then this adds up to five tons per hectare of land. So the organic matter in terms of animal uh, life or and bacterial life uh, and the handful of soil is quite tremendous um, so it's really important that we take a closer look and i mentioned a few terms here and i just thought um, i repeat the tiny bit and also talk at the same time about the classification systems that i use because we have this tremendous biodiversity with um, very diverse taxonomical groups. Uh, actually, a common classification system is simply by body size. And we're starting with very small organisms here um, that are smaller than 0 0.1 millimeters. And this is mainly bacteria uh, and other microbes. Then we have uh, microfauna. Micro is also very small, means small uh, that are similarly just slightly larger and there we have for example nematodes and tardigrades tardigrades are called all the water bears um, and then mesofauna meso means something in the middle so medium sized uh, but as you can see we are talking about small organisms so they are hard to study also because they are so small and uh, they are usually below two millimeters and there we have a lot of mites and springtails and a few other groups then we have macrofauna. Macro means large, but large means in the soil world above 
to millimeters. And there we have ants and termites and isopos and earthworms and some beetles and so on. And finally, we have megafauna, it's very large, but here we meet basically frogs and some mice and voles and so on. And what is very quite interesting is that with increasing body size, the abundance is quite low. So we have increasing abundance, the smaller the organisms are. So we have usually very high numbers of bacteria, uh, but then still fairly high numbers of some of those mites and springtails, for example. But in comparison, the number of um, mice, for example, is quite small because we are talking here about millions and here uh, probably about thousands uh, or less, depending on the area you're looking at. So this is a common classification system and just to introduce you to a few more terms that we are using. So I talked a bit about that we have, we don't know so much and what people have actually tried to do, researchers have tried to summarize actually the knowledge, what has been done. And one group focused here on mapping existing studies uh, onto a world map. And they wanted simply to know what has been done and where in the world. And they focused on three groups that are listed here. Uh, so the different colored circles means different groups and blue this is uh, fungi and yellow we have bacteria and in red uh, we have macrofauna. So remember macrofauna is for example earthworms, ants, and um, such critters. What we see in the distribution here is that particularly in North, North America and Canada, Scandinavia, and then Russia and Siberia, not so much has been done. This is partially uh, probably because we have uh, more ice cover there, but with climate change, some of these ice covers will disappear and um, we want to know what's happening there more, but also it means that, for example, even in Scandinavia, where there are non-permanent uh, ice covers really, basically only part of the groups have been studied, in this case, soil fungi, but a lot of the other groups seem to be, have not been studied. And this is quite interesting, it represents really um, yeah, uh, a picture where we need to do as researchers more to understand uh, more about soil. What this also shows, I told you in the beginning that some of these other uh, species like mites and springtails, uh, like these mesofauna, this intermediate size specimens, they seem to be not even listed here. My suspicion is that uh, they're not good databases exist for those type of specimens. And therefore, they could not be plotted, again, reiterating that we need better uh, databases. Then another study looked more at the sample effort. So these circles that are plotted on this world map again, uh, the larger they are, the studies they looked at uh, used more sampling sizes. So these larger, bigger circles have more than 100 sampling locations. And again, you get a similar picture of Europe, including Scandinavia, quite a bit has been sampled, but in general, the North is probably a bit understudied or undersampled. But this becomes even clearer if we look here at the graph uh, at the bottom, that the sampling effort for different groups is very different. So there are far more studies that look at like bacteria and ants, for example, then at mites and um, springtails. And finally, um, I thought I show a picture here that again deals with biodiversity of different groups, but here is shown the proportion and this greenish color uh, of the species we know already. And in bl this dark blue, uh, the proportion of species that we suspect exist in nature, but that are not studied or described yet. They are unknown to science and the world. What we see here is that some of these species, uh, like mammals, uh, but also fish species and um, larger plants at least, have quite a good proportion of species that are already described, so we know about them. 
However, even if we go to insects like flies, butterflies, and bees, so really species that we can still see with our own eyes, uh, but are fairly small, we see already that the proportion changes quite a bit. So there's a higher proportion of species that we don't know about yet. We suspect that they exist, but science has not had the opportunity to describe them yet or to learn about them. And finally, if we go into the soil, um, we see that the proportion uh, of unknown species is very high. So for nematodes, only 2% of the species diversity uh, is probably described. For springtails, it's a bit more, but still a high proportion unknown. Even for earthworms that are, at least in the soil world, quite large species, they're still probably 75% of the species are unknown to science. Why is this important? If we don't know about them, we can't protect them, but we also don't know what they do actually in the soil, which would be quite important to know if we want to improve soil health, which is one of the sort of end goals we have with this research. And below here, I can just give a few numbers. These numbers change a bit depending on the source. Um, just to give you an example that really in mites, for example, we have described probably, if these numbers are a bit older, probably 60,000 uh, species are described, but we suspect that there are about 1 million species out globally. The picture is pretty similar for these groups, springtails a bit better. But as you can see, just by these numbers, uh, we have a lot to do and a lot to learn. And this is why um, we here at, uh, at this biological station set up a project to study in more detail three of these understudied groups, which are springtails, mites, and nematodes. And this is simply because we saw from the literature that this represents a real knowledge gap, so not a lot is known. And particularly, not a lot is known in the subarctic or in the northern regions. And part of this project uh, is always to have a lot of collaboration partners. So they, these are listed here. And the reason for this is because it takes a lot of time to become actually an expert in each of these groups. So we need an expert for mites that really can take a specimen and look at it under the microscope and find out, okay, this is probably this species, but this looks new, this looks different. Maybe this is a new species. And to describe uh, this biodiversity, we need basically experts that had really learned to determine those species and to get to know these species over 10 or 20 years. It takes a long time to train up uh, a person that is a specialist in a particular group, like mites or springtails or nematodes. And then on the right hand side here, I just show you some of the sampling locations um, that we have along the borders here and uh, further in the north. And the idea is simply to cover as much ground as we can, different habitats, for example, birch forest and pine forest, or more lake uh, shores and other soil types, because we suspect specialists in each of these habitats, so different species that have different, um, are differently adapted to certain uh, habitats. And I will talk a bit later about this following part. So these experts uh, do this with microscopes. So they're looking at, at the um, specimen, at the morphology. But we can do this also, and this has become more popular in the recent past with genetics. So part of this project is also to come up with basically a barcode, like you have a product barcode on a product that you buy. We can use genetic information to create a barcode that we can say, okay, this piece of genetic information is unique to a particular species. So we combine these two methods to then be able uh, to later with the genetic method to identify species more quickly. I will talk about a bit more about this in a minute. And with this, I have sort of mentioned also uh, already a bit the methods. Uh, I thought I'd give you a quick overview of methods we are using and how you, for example, can use those 
in a classroom setting uh, if you're interested to also study a bit of um, soil uh, biodiversity. So we'll talk a bit about collection methods and then modern methods, which mainly the genetic methods, and then one ecological methods that can also be used uh, to study soil activity and soil health. Starting with some of these collection methods, basically what we are doing is we go out in the field and again, we have probably a, a study design that we say, okay, we want to collect in different habitats, like different forest types or more tundra habitat. Um, and then we collect samples, take photos of the vegetation that is found around the sample, as this may give us uh, some more background information about the spot. And here, for example, we always have an identifier and a date so that we can really track the samples we have taken. And uh, another method uh, is to, to collect, for example, moss, uh, moss um, material, like litter material, because some of these soil organisms are also found uh, in that uh, part of the habitat. And here you see one of those taxonomic experts on Fjellberg collecting some of those, that material and looking at it if, for example, some springtails are in that material. More generally, what we are using is a device called uh, Belly's Funnel or Belly's Trap, um, where we put the soil sample on a mesh. So we have a soil sample here with our little critters and we have and a funnel. And then on top we have a light bulb, which of course gives light, but also uh, creates heat. And one of the correct characteristics of soil organisms is that they don't like light, they don't like heat, they don't like dryness, they like it moist and dark. And what this light bulb does, it dries out sort of the surface of the soil. Uh, and of course, the surface will be also warmer than sort of the the bottom of the soil sample here on the mesh. And these specimens uh, migrate towards the bottom. At some point they fall through this mesh into a collection jar. And in this collection jar, we can take them and look at them under the microscopes and study them. So, and then really the experts look at them one by one to see if there's anything new in there or if it's, uh, it's new probably to Norway or new to science. And here, this picture or the slide I just put in there, um, although that we have we have uh, custom-made ballets uh, traps, but uh, I put a link here to a journal that's specifically um, designed to uh, give scientific information uh, to kids and. Um, it's quite interesting because one article that I have linked here describes how you can make your own ballet straps uh, for yourself uh, privately or as a school project. And as you can see, the material you use here uh, is quite everyday material, a light bulb, some cardboard, scissors, some tape, uh, a sort of a sieve, uh, as a mesh. And then it's exactly described how you can set this up to collect your own specimens as a little class project, for example. Then uh, I mentioned nematodes. There we have a similar but slightly different method, uh, which is uh, called a Behrman funnel. And this, the Behrman and Ballets, these were scientists that uh, invented these methods, uh, by the way. And this uh, is also fairly simple, actually, that you have, uh, again, a funnel, but this time with a silicone tube and sort of, you have sort of a squeeze clip because you have water in this funnel and hose. Um, and then again, you have a mesh uh, and sort of a plastic PVC tube. And you put your soil sample in here and nematodes tend to at some point go deeper. They, again, they like it moist, go deeper into the soil. And then they're basically collected at the bottom. They sink to the bottom here. And then we can just release a bit of water and those collected nematodes to then collect them in a collection jar and again, look at them under a microscope. 
However, I sort of hinted already that this is a fairly slow method. So you have to go out in the field, collect your sample, like the ballet's uh, extraction, for example, depending on the moisture level of the soil sample, we leave them for 10 to 14 days. And after this, the uh, experts look at them and really it's, you need an expert for every group and you need an identification one at a time, uh, which is a quite time consuming. And because we are basically losing biodiversity right now because of climate change and habitat degradation, we, are, we scientists look for ways to speed up the process to find actually all these species and describe uh, most of them if possible. And what has been done? Well, there are some other problems. One of them is that some species are so similar that we actually can't just rely on morphology, just on the exterior appearance alone. For microorganisms, about 90% of the species actually can't be cultured in a lab. Uh, this means we can't grow them. Uh, and this means we can't study them in detail. And what this means is that with this approach, we basically rarely come to study more like ecosystem roles these species have when it's quite slow. And therefore, in recent years, uh, DNA-based methods, so using genetic methods, uh, have been developed. And I just run you through this uh, experiment here. But if you want to know more about this, uh, I have also uh, one or two other uh, talks in this webinar series where I talk a bit more about the genetics and the genetic background of these methods. In this case, uh, we have our soil sample and we are able to take a tiny bit of soil and extract DNA from it in the lab and then have other lab procedures that in the end give us a sequence, a series of nucleotides. So DNA has four nucleotides. These are four different colors here. And this is A, T, C, and G, standing for four different nucleotides. And a series of nucleotides we can compare between samples. Let's say we have two samples and I've highlighted here in red differences in those sequences. And by comparing this, we probably come to the conclusion, okay, so they are so different from their genetics that they are most likely different species. And the ad main advantage of this is that it's faster and we can study more species uh, at the same time simultaneously from a habitat. So these two approaches together are quite the morphological and this uh, genetic based method together um, gives us a very good indication what is in the soil sample we are looking at. And finally, I thought I'd talk a bit about an ecological uh, study. And what has been used uh, quite a bit are so-called bait lamina strips. These are these strips that are shown here at the bottom. These are basically plastic strips usually, and they have holes in them. And those holes are filled with quite some yummy food that soil organisms like to eat. And uh, they're basically put into the soil uh, and usually there's a study design in the background. In this particular example, it was sort of a controlled site. It did not have pollution and uh, polluted site. And the scientists wanted to know okay, does pollution actually affect activity of soil organisms? Because this would, of course, be an indication that they're not doing well or that the level of biodiversity is quite low. So they put out these lamina strips in, those, in the soil of these two habitats and compared how, ma how many holes are actually either empty or half eaten and sort of summed this up and could then give an indication and you probably can see just from looking at it that you have really empty holes in this controlled site, but the polluted site, only a bit of activity was found, indicating that this polluted site has probably quite a lower level of, of species and activity going on. And so that's something this pollution may have a strong impact on the soil health in total. And the middle part, um, 
yeah, so I studied also how to analyze these soil strips. Uh, because originally you only said there is something eaten and not, and this was a pretty rough scale, whereas they came up with a more refined scaling scheme that they say, okay, it's fully eaten or half eaten or just a bit uh, eaten. And then if you take this into account, you just have a bit of better resolution in your interpretation. So this is just this middle part. So generally we can, use those to see uh, if there is a difference in uh, activity of soil organisms and then we can study for example polluted versus non-polluted sites or different habitats for example so this gives us also an indirect indication of soil biodiversity okay so we have talked a bit about uh, different methods we are using and that can be also used um, by uh, classrooms, for example, to set up a little experiment. And so now I thought I'd talk a bit about one or two groups um, in a bit more detail what functions they actually have. These are just examples. Uh, so there's far more biodiversity out there. Um, but I thought I'd talk about uh, mites and springtails because these are some of the groups we are studying. Starting with soil mites, we have uh, soil mites are a quite successful group. They're found almost everywhere in soil. And uh, they have three major groups. These are these three pictures. It's not important that you remember the names, but these little pictures are also found below here again and indicate simply which groups have which function in the soil. And if we start here with the plant feeders, uh, a lot of people, I think, uh, think about soil, when they think about soil organisms, think about that they're probably eating sort of roots and uh, parasites. But for example, for the mites, this is an, uh, absolutely not true. There are very, very few species that are actually connected and eat uh, live plant material, living plant material. Quite to the contrary, they uh, help in um, making and in recycling uh, dead litter materials like dead leaves or dead uh, body parts of other insects uh, and help therefore in the decomposition process that's happening in the soil to recycle this organic material and release nutrients into the soil and therefore are also contributing to sort of a natural recycling and um, fertilization process in the soil. Then you have uh, microbial feeders. Uh, so these are, you have also a, a food web in the soil. So some mites feed on uh, microbial bacteria, for example. And by doing this, because they're grazing on them, they're also distributing them uh, throughout the soil, for example. And by eating them also there again, there's a recycling process in a way going on, releasing nutrients and by dispersing them and so on, they help also with microbial growth and uh, activity. And finally, we have a group that are predators that are feed on other soil organisms like springtails or nematodes. And um, this is also an important function because what mites do, for example, we have nematodes, we have quite a number of species that actually are parasites uh, and live around plant roots. And if we have healthy soils, then mites contribute by eating nematodes to reduce the population size of those parasitic nematodes. Just one example is giving here that sort of one adult mite uh, and uh, the offspring can consume about 20,000 uh, nematodes in just 10 days. So they're quite efficient regulators in the soil and regulate the population size of other species. So this is just an example of ecological functions uh, some of these species have. And as a second, and I just wanted to mention here that plant feeders are called also herbivores. Um, yeah, just as an additional piece of info. And then we have springtails uh, as a second group. Uh, and here on the left-hand side, 
um, just a few pictures how they look uh, under the microscope close up. And here's sort of a schematic outline. And the most important thing here is that they have a, um, yeah, an appendix uh, which is called a Fulker to jump. So spring, springing, so jumping. Uh, this is really uh, the preferred uh, way of transportation for springtails. And just to show you this uh, a bit more, I have a video and I hope this actually works. Just wait a tiny bit. Yes, so just a little impression um, how springtails actually move uh, if we find them uh, sort of above ground, but they live also, a lot of species will live below ground in the soil. And that's just as a second example, I thought um, that I also talk you through some of the functions they have. It's quite similar actually to the mites, so it's a bit of repetition also, which is probably good. And if we start uh, here, then also springtails contribute to basically a natural recycling process of organic material, as maybe dead leaves, for example. And this process is also called decomposition. And by, so they help also by this decomposition process, they help to form soil actually, uh, and ox, uh, and this is quite important that these soil organisms organisms um, contribute thereby also to soil structure. So how the, the soil is built up, some soil organisms like for example, earthworms have also the function to, because we know they have these uh, little tunnels in, uh, in the earth, they contribute also quite a lot to the soil structure and that we have ventilation and also water transport so that the water can easy, uh, get into the soil. So spring tails also contribute uh, as one group to soil structure built up. Uh, then we have, uh, and they're also feeding again on uh, microbes and help particularly around the roots that uh, microbes are transported and dispersed. Then we have some uh, spring tails are found around the uh, roots and because they are, they help with this recycling process, they also get nutrients closer to the roots for, uh, of these plant species and help thereby uh, with nutrient uh, supply. 
And then the springtails themselves can be food for, let's say, spiders or other uh, animals. Again, this is a food web function, so that um, uh, also other animals find food. And then there's uh, uh, some springtails that live on plants. And there they're feeding also often basically of uh, microbes of bacteria and help with dispersal. So again, these little creatures have quite a versatile set of functions uh, in the ecosystem and they are very important to improve um, physical and chemical properties in the soil and really they're all connected. It's a network that um, is very important to be intact. So more general, uh, general and just summarizes a tiny bit that a lot of these soil organisms, we haven't talked about all of them, but every little critter in soil has its tasks to contribute to overall soil health, to help with uh, recycling decomposition of uh, organic matter, um, and uh, also regulates population size of other uh, species. And it's important uh, to get nutrients to plants, for example, which of course is connected, for example, also to us humans and food production. And they contribute by releasing these nutrients, they contribute to uh, different nutrient cycles like nitrogen, carbon cycle and water cycle. Uh, and by contributing to the soil structure, they improve also water filtering, so taking contaminants uh, out of the water so that we have good ground uh, water, which we partially use as drinking water. And by releasing this, they are very uh, important in a natural fertilization process, so we humans uh, have used quite a bit of synthetic um, fertilizer. And I will talk in a bit why this is not a good idea. So an attacked ecosystem, soil ecosystem means that it's a quite good, healthy and nutritious soil that of course leads to more nutrient rich uh, plants and also better growth of plants. In the very beginning, I talked a tiny bit about uh, that climate change is qu uh, quite important for us here in the north uh, because it's happening faster. So the temperature changes are faster here than in more southern regions. So I thought I quickly give you one example of what we might expect in the future. It's important to realize that uh, just very few studies uh, have actually looked at that. So it's another area where we need to do more research. But starting uh, with two parameters, it's temperature and precipitation, so rainfall. And these are important for soil organisms because, as I said, they don't like it hot, they don't like it dry. So they want moisture and darkness. And that's why these two factors are drivers in annual changes. And sort of these cyclic uh, annual changes we see in either occurrence or in different life stages is also called phenology. And these, uh, these changes over the year, they are timed quite accurately by nature. And if there are mismatches in different processes, then often the system doesn't work properly anymore. And this is one of the main concerns we have with climate change. It's, distributions of species change or activity levels so that some of these ecological processes do not fit anymore. There are mismatches in the timing, which uh, can be a problem. And if we first start with this picture here, we have a location, it's a hypothetical location where we have um, in red the temperature over the year and uh, the bars are then the, diff the, the rainfall amount uh, over the year. And as you can see in this particular location, we have currently a climate where it's hotter in the summer, cooler in the winter, and you have probably the most precipitation somewhere in autumn, uh, but overall you have some precipitation throughout the year. And 
here we have some of those soil organisms I have been talking about. And what's uh, important to realize is that most of those soil organisms are found probably in the top 10 to 15 centimeters, which you call also the top soil. It's at the top in the soil. Uh, and here most of the activity pattern happens. If this is a graph showing uh, activity according to depth in the soil. So at the in the top soil just uh, below the surface, we have most of the activity because we find most of those organisms in that area. And as I said, uh, spiders or beetles feed on some of those soil organisms and um, and these soil organisms are important for nutrients so that the plants can grow uh, well. And because we have a higher temperature in the summer, we have over the year, this is again time and this is activity, we have sort of a dip in activity usually in the summer because it's quite hot. Uh, and again, those soil organisms don't like this. What ha might happen with climate change, it's first of all that weather events become more unpredictable, but probably in general, we have an increase in temperature. This is one of the, the predictions. And in this particular example, we have also less precipitation suddenly in the summer. So it's hotter and drier in the summer. And what happens is that then generally these soil organisms will migrate further into the soil uh, similar to the Belay's uh, funnel trap I showed, because they don't like heat, dryness, uh, and they will go down where it's cooler and where there's more moisture. So the activity level, the spatial activity level will be shifting. You won't have necessarily most of the activity directly in the, at, in the topsoil layer, um, because these animals are migrating lower. This can create a problem with this nutrient cycling I talked about. So the because of less activity in the topsoil, those plants will probably get less nutrients, for example. And because the specimens go further into the soil, uh, also some predators like beetles may have body size shifts because they can't find enough springtails to eat, for example. So again, there's a cascade effect of different things and you probably don't have as good of plant growth either because of the lack of nutrients. And finally, if you look at this graph, the activity will, uh, level will be very, very low in the summer because it's dry and hot at this point. So we may sh uh, see quite a lot of changes in, in soil when it comes to climate change. And we have to think about, if we think about food security for humans, for example, we have to think about how we can uh, combat this and come up with strategies that increases soil health. So if you look here first at the right hand side, um, it just summarizes a bit what happens, what I have mentioned. So in the past and still ongoing currently, we have quite intensified uh, agricultural practices where we use, use a lot of fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers. We have climate change happening in the background, but we may have also other pollution like industrial pollution going on. And all these factors lead to that these um, soil organisms uh, decrease in abundance. And one, of, so we have generally low uh, biodiversity in soils if it's very intensified agriculture. And this means that a lot of these natural processes are not functioning uh, anymore very efficiently, but also it means that other species that are pests or parasites, that they can increase in number. Remember that I talked about uh, this with the mites, that they regulate uh, the number of specimens of nematodes, parasitic nematodes, for example. And what we is increasingly done and what a lot of research goes also in, uh, into is how do we do we do this better, especially because we have a changing climate. So the aim is, of course, to have high biodiversity, a high number of these beneficial organisms that help with soil structure and water regulation and so on, and that we have 
by this also a lower number of pest species, so also a lower use of pesticides, for example, that are also not very good for nature, but also not good for humans. So it's really sort of, uh, again, everything is connected. If we have uh, good animal health in the soil, then we have better plant health. And by this also humans benefit from more nutritious and healthier food. And here is just uh, summarized to just uh, drive this home also a bit clearer how many functions or services we find in the soil uh, that are very beneficial to us humans. So, um, so we have first the, the soil organic matter here, the soil basically in the middle. We talked about biodiversity and uh, soil formation a bit, soil structure, uh, nutrient cycling and also water cycling that is all connected and it's very important uh, for the health of the soil. But th th all these basically support a series of services for humans that are usually categorized in three different fields. Uh, these are um, uh, provisioning, regulating, and cultural uh, ecosystem services. I'll just name a few here. For the provisioning, we have, we talked uh, quite a bit, uh, basically soil provides habitat for other organisms uh, and thereby increases biodiversity and also increases resilience to bi uh, for biodiversity. It has a filtration function that we get clean drinking water and we just talked about food production. Regulating services, uh, biological control is by basically to keep uh, parasitic species, so pest species at bay, for example. Climate control is very important because we have a huge carbon storage uh, in the soil. I will talk about this in a minute a bit more. And then uh, we uh, natural natural waste recycling, this is nutrient recycling again. Then we have cultural services. And you can think about this probably like gardening, for example, as a hobby where people use, work with soil and it uh, gives them relaxation, for example, by doing this as a hobby we are using soil for. So a lot of benefits in healthy soils. And then of course, one of the questions, what can we do to reduce and combat climate change effects? And one thing every one of us can do and can be also a school project is to have a compost. Um, and I will uh, end this talk uh, with a few thoughts on this, so why this is beneficial. Uh, because I think if we do all do our bit, then we can actually make an impact, a quite significant impact. First of all, it's uh, important to know that a lot of uh, organic material land ends up in landfills, where we also uh, dispose of uh, various other uh, garbage we produce. But landfills are the third largest source of human related methane, so green gas emissions in the US, for example, and it's pretty much similar all over the world. And the problem is that in a landfill, these organic materials are not properly recycled, so they're just uh, sitting there and decaying, um, basically, and there they can contribute 20 times more and produce 20 times more of um, uh, greenhouse emissions uh, as composting. However, if we properly use and recycle this material for compost, then those emissions become actually negative. So it has quite an effect on avoiding the production of greenhouse gases. However, uh, Composting, similar to decomposition in natural soils, and compost, of course, uses, for example, earthworms to help with this composting, has the same benefits as this natural decomposition process. You have a higher nutrient content, you have a better water holding capacity because of this microclimatic soil structure, and um, you have then, uh, if you use this compost, you distribute it again uh, into fields, for example, you may help 
avoiding erosion and runoff systems. The one other thing I wanted to mention here is that I talked about synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. It is much better to have compost with this natural fertilization process than these synthetic nitrogen fertilizers because they contribute uh, basically to an over abundance of certain nutrients uh, and also to nitrous oxidite uh, emissions that are also not uh, positive for the health of the environment. Uh, and composting, the natural pos process uh, takes quite a lot of time, this decomposition, and really have this very nutrious topsoil layer uh, in nature can take, depending on the the region we are talking about, about almost 2,000 years to produce six inches, about 15 centimeters of topsoil. But with compost, we can actually speed up this uh, process. We can help uh, producing actually this very rich soil. And I had also mentioned already that soil is a carbon binder, it's a carbon sink, so a lot of uh, carbon dioxide can be bound in soil. So here's a number um, estimated uh, that the world soil holds about 1.5 trillion tons of carbon uh, in the form of organic matter. And here it comes again, this uh, healthy soil versus unhealthy soils. Uh, that we have degraded soils that actually release carbon uh, into the atmosphere. However, with if we distribute this, uh, this top soil compost layer, we can, and thereby improve the health uh, of the habitat, we can actually um, re reverse this process. And composting, because it's so nutrient rich, contributes to plant growth, vegetation growth, and thereby can, we can bind even more carbon. So it's very important uh, tool, actually. And in the bigger picture, I just wanted to summarize this, and with this we end the presentation, that degraded soils have been linked to the fall of civilizations because healthy soils mean basically food security. And you have a lot of security in, in a society. This simply helps uh, society itself. You have uh, more profitable farms. Uh, you have enhanced habitat for biodiversity for all these other creatures that live with us, and also more robust ecosystems that can deal better with changes and disturbances. And for a society, um, at the community level, it can create local jobs. We can talk about it and educate each other about environmental issues like we are doing here right now. And it may improve actually a feel of safety uh, and community sense. Uh, it can contribute to healthy diets. And also that we, that local communities may be empowered by the feeling or by, by these processes to contribute um, to composting and soil health. So a lot to think about in terms of uh, what we can do and how important soils are. And I hope uh, I have given you quite a good sense why soil, soils and soil organisms are so important. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy if you have any questions and then we will see if we do the Kahoot or not, depending on how many people are here. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.